Hey guys, it's Courtney from Wonder in English. Today I'm going to do a different style video with you guys where I'm actually going to show my computer screen and I'm going to walk you through all of the top common mistakes that I see my students make. It really changes your essay and your writing when you have correct punctuation versus incorrect punctuation. So it's important to get these commas right. I'm going to teach all the rules for you guys and give some examples and walk you through everything on my computer. So let's get started. Hey guys, it's Courtney from Wonder in English, and today I'm going to teach you when to use commas, how to use them, and when you should not use them. So these are the 16 most important rules that I see my students really tend to make mistakes with, and I hope that today I can explain them in a way that will allow you to understand it and use commas properly so that you don't make those same mistakes. So the very first rule, and the most important one in my opinion, is that commas are really used in order to show that there's a natural pause in a thought in the sentence. This is the most important function of a comma, and we use commas for many different purposes and in many different ways, but I feel like if we really broke it down to its core, this is what commas are used for. They're used to show that there is a pause in natural spoken English. They're also used to help people understand a sentence better. So if there's anything that could possibly be confusing when reading a sentence naturally, the comma will help the reader understand where a concept ends, where a concept begins, where a new idea is being introduced. Anytime there's a shift, anytime there is a shift in the thought or the type of speech, a comma will be used to indicate that. So taking a look at the very first rule, it says that we use commas to set off expressions that interrupt the flow of a sentence, that interrupt the flow of a sentence. So anytime you have a normal sentence and you sort of have this interjection in between explaining information that's not essential to the sentence, you're going to have a comma surrounding that information. So if we look at the example, it says, I am, as you've probably noticed, very nervous about this. So you know that this is interrupting the sentence, as you have probably noticed. We know that it's interrupting the sentence because the sentence would still make sense if we completely removed this section here. It would just say, I am very nervous about this. That's a complete sentence, a complete thought. So if we were able to remove this and it's still a sentence, we know that it's interrupting the flow of an existing sentence to add in this information. This is extra information that's not needed. So in this instance, we're going to add commas before and after. You can also tell because you could move this part of the sentence to a different part, a different area within the sentence, and it would still make sense. For example, you could say, as you've probably noticed, comma, I am very nervous about this, period. And that would make sense. So because this, this whole phrase is able to move to the beginning, to the end, or the middle of the sentence, it is extra information that we don't need, and we need to have commas before and after it. So the second rule is talking about weak and strong clauses. You might also know them as independent and dependent clauses. So an independent clause is essentially just a sentence. It can stand on its own. Like if we're looking at the first example, I am very nervous about this, is an independent clause. Whereas the dependent clause would be, as you probably noticed. As you probably noticed, could not stand by itself, but I am very nervous about this, could. So an independent clause is a simple sentence with a subject and a verb and a complete thought. A dependent clause oftentimes will have a subject and a verb, but it's not a complete thought. So a lot of dependent clauses will start with words like when, for example, or which, and you can't really have a sentence that just starts with which. This is normally a phrase that goes within a sentence, but the sentence itself does not start with which. So for example, let's take a look at this example here. If you're not sure about this, let me know now. The word if makes this a dependent clause. If you're not sure about this, if we put a period here, 
it would not be a full and complete sentence. It wouldn't be an independent clause because we have the word if. If it just said, you are not sure about this period, then yes, it would be an independent clause. But the word if applies this causal relationship. It needs another statement in order to complete the sentence. So this is a dependent clause. It's depending on the sentence, the rest of the words that come after it, in order for it to be a complete thought. Let me know now. This is an independent clause. Let me know now can stand completely by itself. I can say this at any point in time. So whenever you start a sentence with a dependent clause, you have to put a comma and then you'll have the independent clause. However, if you do it the reverse way, if you have the sentence itself first or the independent clause first, you actually don't need a comma between the dependent and the independent clause. So remember, whenever you start a sentence with a dependent clause, you have to put a comma after it when you actually reach the clause that's an independent clause. So if you see it in this example here, it says, let me know now if you're not sure about this. In this case, you don't need a comma because it starts off with a normal independent clause. The third example is about using commas after phrases of three words that begin a sentence. So of course we always use commas in the beginning of a sentence when we have transition words like however, therefore, but we also use these for introductory phrases. So in English, we love to introduce the topic that we're about to discuss with a little tidbit of information. And when we do this, we're just introducing the thought, but we're not having a full and complete sentence. We're having a dependent clause. So because of that, we have to have the comma here. So these are very similar concepts. They're basically saying the same thing because these phrases here are both dependent clauses. So if we look at this example, it says to apply for this job, comma, you must have previous experience. So you need a comma here because this is a dependent clause and it's sort of introducing the topic that you're about to talk about. It comes at the beginning of the sentence. In order to delay the process, comma, she ran down the hall screaming, Bob. If we take a look at number four, you'll see that we're going to use commas in order to further describe someone that's already been sufficiently identified. Basically, the author will determine whether or not the listener or the reader understands who this person is. So if you know who Freddie is, then further describing Freddie is unnecessary. If you're trying to give more context, then of course you can describe Freddie as much as you want. But if you know Freddie and I know that you know Freddie, it's not necessary for me to tell you that he has a limp. So in that case, I'm just adding the fact that he has a limp into the sentence as a stylistic choice because I would like to further describe him. It's non-essential information used to describe him. So in that case, I'm going to insert it after his name and include two commas. Freddie, comma, who has a limp, comma, was in an auto accident. If I remove this information here, the sentence still makes sense on its own and you will still know who Freddie is because I know that you know Freddie. Also, it's very clear because Freddie is a pronoun. Freddie is a specific person. It's somebody's name. It's very clear that you know Freddie. However, if I'm talking to someone else and I just say the boy, well, I don't know that you know which boy I'm talking about. There are so many boys. So how are you gonna know who was in the auto accident if I just say the boy? Well, you know, because I start to give you more specific information, not just any boy, it's the boy who has a limp. In this case, because it's unclear who the boy is, this is essential information in order to describe him. The fact that he has a limp sets him apart from all the other boys. And in this case, it is necessary essential information to describe the boy 
and therefore will not have commas within the sentence. The boy who has a limp was in an auto accident, no commas. So again, whenever you're describing someone, if it's essential to the sentence, there are no commas. If you're describing them to give more context and it's non-essential information, you're going to add commas. So in number five, you can see that we're going to add commas when we have two independent clauses or two sentences. Two sentences that can fully stand by themselves, but we want to add them together because the meaning is very similar or because there is a stylistic reason we want to add them together. Then we'll just have a conjunction between them. These are the conjunctions, and, but, or, for, nor, so, yet. And then we'll have a comma because having an and is not sufficient between two independent clauses, between two sentences. You need a comma and then an and. A comma yet, a comma so. You can't just have so or just have yet or just have and. If you have two dependent clauses or if you have an independent clause and a dependent, then an and by itself would be sufficient. But for two normal sentences added together, you have to have a comma and a conjunction. So if we look at the first example, it says she was not sure if she had the necessary mathematical abilities to be an engineer. That is a sentence on its own. So we want to keep talking about this same thought in another sentence. So we're going to put a comma here and say, so she pursued a graduate degree in history. It makes sense that these thoughts are connected in the same sentence. It makes sense. So we put a comma and a so here in order to apply a causal relationship. Because she studied this, or because she was interested in this or had abilities in this, she pursued her degree in that. So it makes sense. What I notice with my students is that a lot of times they will add sentences together that really would be best if they kept them apart and they make them very long and they tend to have incorrect punctuation. So then it becomes almost, you know, a whole paragraph with only one or two sentences and it's very difficult for the reader to follow. So every writing choice like punctuation has to have a reason behind it. So you're not just going to put these sentences together because you want to make a long sentence. You're going to put them together because there is a causal relationship here, because the ideas are very closely linked and it makes sense to add them together because of that. So just be mindful of that. So this can be a bit confusing if you have two independent clauses that are very, very similar in meaning. For example, if you're talking about the same exact subject in both areas, in both sentences, occasionally you can leave out the comma. I would say if you're confused about this, err on the safe side and, and include a comma anyway. Here's an example of when you do not need a comma, when it's not mandatory. Some doctors advertise their services, but many doctors find this reprehensible. Notice how there's no comma before but, even though these are two independent clauses. Some doctors advertise their services, period. Many doctors find this reprehensible, period. Those are two independent clauses connected with a conjunction that's called but, but there's no comma. Well, you can still put the comma here, that's acceptable. It wouldn't prevent anyone from misreading it. However, it's not necessary because these ideas are so similar. It's really talking about the same exact concept and it has the same exact subject, the same person that's doing the action, doctors. So like I said before, I would err on the safe side if you're ever unsure about it and just place a comma there anyway. So number six is pretty similar to number five. If you have two independent clauses linked together with the same exact subject, you can actually remove the second subject and not place any comma in the sentence. So 
If these were two separate sentences with a period in between, it would read, he thought quickly when asked that difficult question, period. He still did not answer correctly, period. So we wanna combine this thought. So we're going to put a but without a comma and we're going to remove the second subject. He thought quickly when asked a difficult question, but still did not answer correctly. So because we removed the subject, we can't have a comma here anymore. Before in number five, you had the same subject in both sentences with the but and no comma, but the comma was optional. Now the comma is not optional because you removed the subject. So if you put a comma here, but still did not answer correctly, it would be grammatically incorrect. Number seven, this one's pretty simple. As I mentioned earlier, we use commas to make things clearer for the reader. So if you have a normal sentence or a statement, a fact, and then you wanna ask a question within that same sentence, you're shifting, you're shifting your way of speaking from just declaring something, from just saying something to asking a question, all within the same sentence. In order to denote that shift, we need a comma. I can go, can't I? This is a statement, a fact. This is a question. We need to separate these two, these two concepts and we do that through the use of a comma. In a similar vein, we like to use commas to separate contrasting parts of the sentence. So this tends to happen a lot at the end of a sentence, indicating a pause or a shift in the thoughts. So oftentimes you'll see that it's just two words at the end of a sentence that you're separating from the normal declarative statement. He was merely ignorant, comma, not stupid. So you need a comma here because you're shifting the whole thought. You're saying he was this, not that. If you didn't want to have a comma, you would say he wasn't ignorant or stupid, period. But because you're having two contrasting thoughts here, he was this, he wasn't this, these are two contrasting thoughts, two contrasting verbs, you're gonna have a comma here. He was merely ignorant. He was not stupid. So you're basically removing he was from here and just putting a comma instead to indicate that there's a shift in thought. If we take a look at number nine, this one's very simple you'll see that we just add a comma in at the beginning of a sentence whenever we start off with a word like well, now, or yes. And as I mentioned, transition words like therefore, for example, however. You guys have probably seen this a lot if you're reading something or if you're ever producing your own academic writing, I'm sure you've used transition words. Yes, comma, I do need that report. Well, comma, I never thought I'd live to see the day. Therefore, comma, we don't need to pay the vet bill, right? Again, a shift here because they're asking a question at the end when this was a statement before. Number 10 is also simple. You're just going to use a comma to separate the day, the month, and the year. December 5th, comma, 2003, comma, and then continue on with the sentence. You never start a sentence with a number, beware of that. If you start a sentence with a number, you have to write it out in letter form. You can omit commas around the date if you don't have the full date. So for example, if you just said December 2003, you don't need to have a comma because there's no day here. This is called the Oxford comma. When you use commas to separate words and word groups that are typically in a series of three. 
So if we look at this example, we can see that it has my husband, daughter, son, and nephew. So we have four things in this group. My 10 million pound estate is to be split among my husband, comma, daughter, comma, son, comma, and nephew. People will argue whether or not this last comma is necessary. It's called the Oxford comma. And some people argue that it is not necessary because you have the word and. But it's grammatically correct to have a comma and an and here. If it was just an example of three words that were in a group or in a series, it would be my husband, comma, daughter, comma, and son, period. This is one that my students make a lot of mistakes with. You're going to use a comma to separate two adjectives when the word and can be inserted between them. For example, he is a strong and healthy man. That would be a perfectly normal sentence. But it's not necessary to have the word and. So to replace and, we just put a comma between them. He is a strong, healthy man. These are two adjectives describing one person, and the adjectives are right next to each other. In this case, because we can say and here, we're going to put a comma here instead and remove and. So remember, if you see two adjectives next to each other, ask yourself this question. Can I say and? Is it describing the same person? If you answer yes to those questions, then remove and and put a comma there instead. You're also going to have a comma between a city and a state. For example, I live in Melbourne, comma, Florida. This person lives in Trent, comma, Nottinghamshire. So I kind of touched on number 14 earlier when I mentioned the fact that when we are describing people, we don't always need commas if the information is not necessary or not essential for the sentence in order for the person who's listening or reading to understand who you're talking about. We were talking about Freddy versus the boy. I mentioned that the boy was not specific. So in order to fully give the person an idea of who we're talking about, we included the information that he had a limp. And that was essential to the sentence and essential to understanding who we're talking about. So we didn't have any commas with that. In this case, we're also talking about essential and non-essential elements. So any kind of part of the sentence that's not necessary in order to understand the full meaning of who we're talking about or what we're talking about will have commas. And whatever is essential will not have commas. Whenever you have a phrase that begins with that, it is always going to be essential. There is never going to be a comma in front of that. I talked to the boy that was wearing the red sweater. There will never be a comma here because the word that is always an essential element. The apples that fell out of the basket are bruised. Again, no comma because of that. If we take a look at these, these don't have the word that, but they're still essential information. Students who cheat only harm themselves. Well, let's take out who cheat. Students only harm themselves. Technically, the sentence is still grammatical, but it doesn't make sense. You know, why would students harm themselves? We don't have enough context to understand what the person is trying to get at. Why are they writing this sentence? That makes no sense. So we have to include who cheat because then the concept itself makes sense. Students who cheat only harm themselves. Because it's essential to understand the concept of the sentence, we don't need commas. Let's look, take a look at the second example. The baby wearing a yellow jumpsuit is my niece. There can be a lot of babies within the room. So we need to know what the baby is wearing in order to determine which baby you're talking about. Let's say there's four different babies. One's in yellow, 
one's in red, one's in pink, and one's in black. Well, in this case, if you just said the baby is my niece, we won't know which baby you're talking about. So we have to specify the baby wearing a yellow jumpsuit is my niece. So now I can look around the room and see that the yellow baby is yours. If you wanted to say this in a way that it wasn't an essential element, you could say it like this. My niece, comma, wearing a yellow jumpsuit, comma, is playing in the living room. In this sentence, I'm assuming that the person knows who my niece is and that they don't need to know the information that she's wearing a yellow jumpsuit. I'm just adding this information to give a visual context. It's really not necessary. So it's up to you to determine if the listener or the reader knows who your niece is. And if they don't, if there's any confusion at all, if there's any ambiguity at all, then you do not include commas. Then it's an essential part of the sentence. But here it's not essential because I know you and you know my niece and you know that she's playing in the living room. So I just added this information in just to be cute and it's not essential. So I'm going to put commas before and after it. Same thing with Fred. We're talking about students here, students who cheat. Well, you know who Fred is, don't you? So I don't need to specify that he cheats, even though it makes a lot more sense when you read the sentence without context, like you need this part in there. However, let's say that we've been talking about Fred cheating throughout the whole paragraph that we're texting. It's just not necessary to have that information then. If we're talking many sentences prior to this one saying that Fred cheated, and then I said, Fred, who often cheats, is just harming himself. It's kind of weird. Wouldn't you just say Fred is just harming himself because it makes sense in that context? Yeah, that's what you would say. But if for some reason you wanted to include more information like this, it's not essential. And you're going to add commas before and after it to show that it's not essential. You're also going to use commas to set off phrases at the end of the sentence that normally would go somewhere else within the sentence. Nancy waved enthusiastically at the docking ship, comma, laughing joyously. All right, so there's only one subject here, Nancy. So we know she has to be laughing, laughing joyously. She's really excited about that ship coming in, clearly. So because she's so excited, we want to include that here. We want to talk about how excited she is. But we already said that she waved enthusiastically. So we don't really need to say, Nancy, laughing joyously, waved enthusiastically at the docking ship. That's, that's a little bit too much detail next to Nancy, right? So in order to give that a little bit of space, we want to show why she's excited first and then add on a little bit of extra information at the end saying, oh, and she was laughing too. So in order to do that, you just separate it by a comma here. Here again, we can see another instance in which we would use this. Laughing joyously, comma, Lisa waved at Nancy. This can go either, either at the beginning or the end. But in that case, mm, we wouldn't know who is laughing joyously, right? Lisa waved at Nancy, laughing joyously. Well, who was laughing, Lisa or Nancy? We don't know. So even though it can go at the end, we're not going to do that because that wouldn't make any sense in English. English is one of those languages that likes to attach the descriptions to the closest person. So we know that Lisa waved. Lisa did this action because, you know, it's close to Lisa. So we know that Lisa did it. We also know that Lisa was laughing joyously because it's close to Lisa. But this one is not as clear because even though it's close to Nancy, we wanna attach it to Nancy. We wanna think that Nancy was laughing joyously 
However, Lisa's the one doing the action, so wouldn't she the one be laughing? So we're really not sure. So if you want to use information like this, you're going to put it at the beginning of the sentence, separate it by a comma, and keep it next to the person who did it. When there's two different people who could have done this action, that's what you're going to do. In this case, it doesn't matter. We can put it at the end because it's only Nancy in that sentence. If you want to illustrate that it was definitely Nancy who was laughing and there's two people, you can add the word who. Lisa waved at Nancy, comma, who was laughing joyously. So this description we know is describing Nancy because the word who indicates that it's going to attach to the person that is directly said right before it. And a comma is necessary in this situation. And the very last one that I often see my students make mistakes with is with quotes. So if you have a normal sentence and then you want to add a quote to it, you need to have a comma in between that sentence and where the quote starts. Obviously, if you just started off a sentence like this, you wouldn't need any commas here because it's just a quote from the very beginning of the sentence. But oftentimes we like to have quotes in the middle of a sentence. So remember, you're going to have a comma instead of a full stop or a period. You're going to have a comma and then you're going to start your quote. And the quote will always be followed by another capital letter. Also note that the punctuation or the period will go at the very end but within the quotation mark. I really loved when he said, comma, you're hilarious, period, quotation mark. Okay, guys, I hope that was helpful for you. If so, leave a thumbs up or leave a comment so I can know that you like this kind of stuff. I think writing is super, super fun. It's one of my favorite things to do, and I would honestly love to share more things like this with you guys if it's not too boring. If it is, let me know. I can try to mix it up a little bit. So I look forward to seeing you guys next week. Have a good weekend. Bye.